Hey, good morning, church. Let's get started. So good to see you. Don't you love it? We've got this side of the church is listing now because people don't sit in the same place. That's really good. That's really good. That's a, that's a sign. That's a good sign. Come and have a seat and uh, welcome. If you're visiting, we've got one, at least one visitor. We may have a couple of others. Um, we'll welcome you a little bit more formally later on. But for now, let's get started. So um, the altar, everything is dressed in red today. Any idea what red means? Martyrdom and saints. And um, any idea which saint follower of Jesus, we are remembering today. St. Luke. Yes. Why do we spend one Sunday dedicating uh, our thoughts and prayers um, about the life of St. Luke? So what can you tell me about St. Luke? First question, was he a disciple of Jesus, one of the 12? He wasn't. What was his profession? He was a doctor, probably a surgeon as well. Yeah, we could rip out those appendix. No problems. Give us a knife. Um, He also, what can you tell about his gospel in the way he wrote? He was thorough. He was thorough. He's a historian. He knew how to write history. When you see pictures of St. Luke in the iconography, you'll always see him in front or next, standing next to an ox. What does the ox symbolise in the writing of the Gospel of Luke? Now, it's a theological question here. Each of the four Gospels have a different symbol with them. Luke is represented by the symbol of an ox, which is the symbol of human strength and power. And so a lot of what you see in the Gospel of Luke refers to the characteristics and aspects of Jesus in his humanness. He is totally God, but he is also totally man. And consequently, Luke is one of, the own, uh, one of only two of the Gospels that records the birth of Jesus. Because we're trying to emphasise his manliness as well as his godliness. And so um, the Gospel of Luke, and it's called an evangelist because Luke wrote his Gospel to all the Greeks out there, to all the people who um, you know, didn't necessarily know about Jesus. And so he wanted to write, uh, in his words, an orderly account of the life of Jesus. And he tells a story. So today, as a theme, we're going to not... I'm not going to preach from the Gospel of John this week in light of the fact that it's the, um, the Feast of St Luke. I'm going to do a sermon on what we need to hear from God in terms of what the sort of things are that St Luke has taught us. So we'll get onto that a bit later on. It's in preparation for our Advent season, two seasons in the year that are penitential Advent and Lent. And during those four weeks and five weeks in Lent, we always preach and talk about the disciplines of the Christian life. So we'll be talking about one of the disciplines today. But having said that, the festival of St. Luke, the feast of St. Luke um, and um, messages from Luke. And don't forget, immediately after the service today, we've got lunch. I'd sure love it if you would be willing to stay um, afterwards for lunch. And uh, we're going to move the pews forward, set up in the back room. We don't want food in the sanctuary, of course, but we move everyone into the back and uh, we'll have uh, lunch together as well. So you're more than welcome to stay. Okay, so are you ready for church, church? Yes. That wasn't very enthusiastic, except, except for Joy Lynn. You were enthusiastic. Let's try that again because we're coming with anticipation. Are you ready for church, church? Now, nah, come on, stand up, please. Everything you need is in the bulletin, and uh, we'll follow along with our Trinitarian greeting as we start off. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Well, thank you. Listen to the call to worship. Psalm 
Psalm 63, verse 3. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. So you're going to hear this today in the music and in the sermon and the readings. Your love is better than life. So David is putting, the king who wrote this psalm, is putting life in the context of eternity. The love of God, which will embrace us for all of eternity, is way more important than just living here on this earth to get us to this side of death. And then he goes on to say that my lips will glorify you. That's what we're going to do as we worship and sing and pray and do the communion together. And I'll praise you as long as I live. And, I, and in your name, I will lift up my hands. That's a, that's a metaphor for saying you are going to serve God. You're going to do things for him more important than all the stuff you do here on the earth and your job and your work and all of that, that's important, don't get me wrong, but that your MO, your vocation, your purpose for living is to lift up your hands to him, is to serve him. And here's a question that you can think about from now as we go through the service. Are you available enough for God to call on you so that you can serve him? Or are you so busy that he can't call on you because you're too busy? So today, think about this. I'm going to lift my hands up. Today might be a good day to think about your serving him and what you do and how you do that. Because the eternity, context of eternity, love is way more important than just getting to this side of death. So think about that as we worship now. So um, remain standing. Jenny's going to lead us in worship.
in Israel and we say Lord have mercy we say Lord may many people on the different sides have a revelation of who you are you have seen many wars and you have been the rescuer and the Redeemer of Israel. And we ask, Lord, for your mercy. We ask, Lord, that you would protect the innocent people. We pray, Lord Jesus, for your hand of mercy on those who are traumatized and who have lost loved ones. We pray for those who are held captive. We say, Lord, have mercy. Let all of the people have dreams and visions of you, Yeshua Messiah, God of Abraham. Holy are you, Lord, that they may say, as the scriptures say, Jesus, the name above all names, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And before you we sing these songs, how great is our God. 
how great is our God and all will see how great is our God. Let's just sing the chorus a few times and envisage the Lord over all this. He's not just Lord of this sanctuary. He is over all. And there will be a day with no tears, no fighting, no wars, no sin. And that's called heaven. Thank you, Lord, for your story of redemption. Jesus on the cross. How great is our God. was in Jerusalem, um, this lady lives in Mozambique, but she was in Jerusalem the day before everything hit the fan, and she said, we need to carry the shalom of the Lord. We need to carry the shalom. 200 of the captives were set free. They said in a canine team, so 200 are saved. That's awesome. Praise the Lord. So let's sing this song, Carry Us. I'll be the carrier of love and compassion. I'll be the carrier of light to the world. I'll be the carrier of hope and salvation. I will go shine your light to the world. <clears throat> The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor, to bind up the broken heart, to make you know even more, so that people living in darkness will see the great light. The spirit of the, of the Lord. The spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor, to bind up the broken heart, and to make you know me more, so that people living in darkness will see the grace. I'll be the carrier of love and compassion. I'll be the carrier of light to the world. I'll be the carrier of hope and salvation. I will go shine your light to the world. I will go. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, freedom and truth to proclaim. Trade your rash 
hiding place, my hiding place, my safe refuge, my treasure, Lord, you are my friend and king, anointed one, most holy, my hiding place, my safe refuge. His love endureth forever. Love one another as I have loved you. We put our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust his holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. Psalm 33. Do not fear what they fear, for I have overcome the world. Mm -hmm. Do not judge others. Perfect love casts out fear. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Please, please be seated. Sometimes God will use people in the congregation to speak to us when we need to get his attention. And so uh, it's a good opportunity every once in a while to keep your ears open, pay attention to what God's doing. Well, I'd like to welcome our visitors today. So um, let's go down this side. Some of you usually sit on that side and I just love it that you're sitting on that side. You know. I went to a church once in another country, let's just say it that way, Jenny and I were visiting, and uh, I sat down here in the pew and, uh, you know, we came a little bit early, expectant to go to church and hear the word of the Lord, and this little old lady came up to me and she said, you know, you're sitting in my chair. Sorry, ma'am, would you like me to move? That's not how it should be at church. Like, what, you own a pew? <laughs> No, you don't. <laughs> We're just fortunate to be here. Better than waking up in palliative care, right? So thank you, Jesus, for whatever seat. But I just love it that you understand that this is not your place in the sense of where you sit. You can sit everywhere. So we've got some new people here today. So um, our newest sister in the Lord, Anita, has brought a friend. Um, Anita, would you like to welcome, uh, uh, introduce... Your new friend to us. Yeah. Let's welcome Gwen, everybody. So Gwen has just moved into Evergreen and Anita brought her 
thank you, you can be seated. Anita brought her to prayer last night. You know we're at the prayer vigil. And lo and behold, if Gwen didn't know, Ed and Janice from years ago. So um, it's great to have Gwen visiting. And Anita's got a new friend now too. So thank you for bringing her. And I can see Peter and Marie back here. Murray, back again. So um, welcome to you. Is this your first time in this church? First time. First time in the church. Beautiful. Okay. Well, listen, then your, your visitors, I guess, so could you stand up? And we just want to welcome you, Peter. Is it Marie or Marie? Marie. Marie. Peter and Marie. Let's welcome them. And do you guys still live in South Surrey? Do you, do you still live in South Surrey? In the same place? Great to have you with us. Fantastic. Um, now, let's go down this side here. Um, okay, Brian, did you bring a couple of your mates with you today? Well, no, uh, I do know a couple of them. Okay, would you introduce them for us? Uh, yes. Well, Peter, right? No, um, Tim. Tim, I went from the wrong way. I do this. Tim, um, Tim, I've, I've met you before a couple of times, but just walked in today and uh, he's come to join us. I don't know who actually did. Where, where, where do you, Tim, where do you, where do you live? Where, where, where do you live? In Ocean Park. So everybody, let's welcome Tim from Ocean Park. <laughs> well, I've been here before. We have royalty. He's been here before. Yeah. Brad. He's Brad. Our, he's our king of floors. King of floors. Brad, it's great to have you back again. Let's welcome Brad back. Great. And is that Ellen behind there? Okay, Ellen, thank you. It's good to see you. Brian and Hope back too. Good to see you guys. Okay, so we've got a full compliment today. Everybody that's supposed to be here is here today. So praise the Lord for that. That's really great. Um, uh, we have one child today. So are we going to do joy time? Or are we going to go for a walk? What are we going to do today? Okay, Joy Lynn is going to stay and hear the sermon. Praise the Lord for that. We probably need to give her a pen and paper so she can draw the sermon too. Fantastic. I do pray for our other church, uh, our, our other family, um, families who belong to this church. Um, bringing four kids to church at once can be a challenge. So we keep praying for our children in this community. Right. It's time to do our scripture reading. Um, we're going to be reading from 1 Peter today. It's not the gospel, so you don't have to stand. And we're going to ask John to read for us. The reading from 1 Peter, chapter 4, verses 7 to 11. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind, so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone else speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ, to him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Okay, I'm going to try and do something today that's almost impossible. I'm going to try and share with you some spiritual truths that are completely unnatural. 
They are completely opposite to the natural person. These are spiritual truths. I don't know if they're going to get through, but we definitely need prayer before we preach this sermon. Um, On page 10, I've given you 10 sentences, 10 truths. I do believe these could change your life, but I warn you now that what I want to preach today uh, doesn't make sense in the world's thinking. Um, This is kingdom thinking. So would one of you lead us in a prayer and it'll be up to you whether this sermon works or not. (laughs) And no pressure. (laughs) But someone pray. Father, we are so thankful for Pastor Peter. Thank you for his faithfulness to preach the truth of your word. Thank you that he's unafraid to do that. And Father, I pray that this morning he would know an extra measure of your anointing and strength and undergirding. I'm sure he is weary. So I pray that you would infuse him with energy. And Father, I pray for us that you would break through any barriers or walls that we have erected in our hearts and minds, that we would be able to receive the truth this morning, and Lord, that you would continue your amazing work of changing us to be more like you. Mm. In Jesus' name I pray, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So whichever metric you use, and you can look up hundreds of surveys on the internet, whichever metric you use, the church in North America is slowly dying. Church attendance is down. People are leaving the church in droves. Christianity is no longer um, something that people do. And even when you get to people in many churches, it's a thing you do on Sunday, but Monday to Saturday, just carry on your living your life. So this sermon today is for those of us who are real followers of Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, and if you've dedicated your life to following Jesus, and you're really, really serious about your faith... If you love Jesus with all your heart, and if you're a regular here, the reason why you've remained in this church is because you're really serious about Jesus. If you just want to play games, you probably don't survive this church and my preaching. The reason why you're here is because you really, really love Jesus. But I want to warn you today that we face a formidable enemy. This morning I want to share with you one of the most strategic tactics that the enemy of the soul uses against us. And his purpose is to make you impotent as a Christian, which is what we see a lot in North America. We've got all these programs, TV programs, mega churches, everything, the church is dying. If the enemy of our souls can affect this problem in us, it's the next best thing to preventing salvation. If he can't stop you from being saved, he's going to get you with this. And sadly, this demonic strategy has afflicted many, many Christians. I'll give you a clue where we're going today. I've entitled my sermon, Distracted. (coughs) Distracted. Here's the principle. If the enemy of our souls cannot get us undercommitted as Christians, guess what he'll try and do? Get us so overcommitted that we're as ineffective. The result of this strategy is that 
many, many Christians are really busy doing things for God. But they are ineffective in the kingdom of God. Not because they're not keen to serve God. We, 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 those of us who love Jesus, we want to serve God. Absolutely. We, we're really, really willing. But the danger for us is that we can be distracted from God, what God wants us actually to do. We can be so busy doing things for God that we get distracted from the things that God wants us to do. So let's explore this strategy of the enemy. And my, my prayer, as I prayed this week for you and for me in this sermon, is I'm going to throw all this stuff at you and I hope maybe something might stick. Maybe something of these ten truths that I'm going to share with you, maybe one of them might stick and it will help you in your journey. So let's have a look at the first couple of principles. The first half of the sermon is just exploring the, the strategy that the enemy is using and the second half of the sermon is from Peter looking what we can actively do to counter this strategy of the enemy. So the first one, it's not the best acronym in the world, but being F-A-T. I know that's a bit sensitive. I don't mean to offend anyone. But the point is the acronym is Faithful, Available and Teachable, right? We often talk about in the Christian life about being F-A-T, Faithful, Available and Teachable. Now, as a pastor, you can talk to pretty well every pastor about this. Most of the people in your church are really faithful and teachable. But guess which part of the FAT is more difficult to find? Anybody want to guess? Available. available. Not to the pastor. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about available to God. See, many Christians are so busy doing all sorts of things in their home, private life, their work life, their church life, their Christian life. They're so busy doing stuff that they're not actually available for God to use them because <laughs> they're doing so many God things. They're working for God. And honestly, if I were to take a survey today, how many of you don't answer this? This is one of the questions I don't want you to answer publicly. But how many of you are nearly frazzled and near burnout? I can tell you amongst the pastors, it's most of them. I can be honest with you, I'm tired but I'm not burnt out. But there are at least four pastors on the peninsula out of 25 churches that are struggling with burnout right now. So how does that happen? How do, how do we get to the point where we're burned out, where we're working for God? Here's a question. Don't answer this one either. If God were to call you to do something, would you actually be available to do it? You understand, the principle is this. For those of us who love Jesus... We don't have to make decisions like good and bad, you know. Do I go to a pub and get drunk or do I go to a prayer meeting? Although for some Christians that's a very real challenge. But for most of us, it's not that obvious. The, the, for us, it's do I go to a prayer meeting or do I stay home and read my Bible? Or do I go witnessing or do I go serve soup to the homeless? Or The choice between for us is not always do I choose between something good and something bad. I, we have to choose between all these good things and then what God wants us to do. That's a real challenge. So let's unpack this a little bit more. Here's my first principle. Maybe this one will stick. Number one, being available to God is a quality of effective Christians. Being available to God is a quality of effective Effective Christians. 
You may be a famous Christian. You may have 100 million views. You may have a mega church. You may have a huge influence. But in the kingdom of God, are you effective? We'll explore that a little bit. Let's, let, let's unpack this a little bit more. Here's the second thing. Are you working for or are you working with God? So one of the first questions I think would be helpful, I ask myself this regularly, seeing I'm doing lots of things for God. Are you doing things, the things that you do, are you doing them for God or are you doing the things that God wants you to do? You understand there's a very subtle difference. Yeah, here I am, I'm, I'm going down to night shift and I'm serving soup to all the homeless people and then I go to the prayer meeting on Tuesday and the Bible study on Wednesday and I'm doing all these things because I'm helping out God. But the subtle question is, is that what God wants you to do? <coughs> Are you busy for God or are you trying to obey God? You see, there's a subtle difference in this. Because you can be doing a whole bunch of good things, good Christian things, but they may not be what God wants you to do. Now, it's subtle, but I want to see if I can unpack it for you a little bit. You see, you take the Christian pastor, for instance, and people who do full-time Christian work, which actually is a misnomer because every Christian is full-time. Right? <laughs> yeah, well, Peter, you work for Youth for Christ and you, have to give your, you get your money by team support. Uh, I couldn't live by faith like you do. No, 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 hang on, hang on. We all live by faith. Some of us take our salary for granted and some of us don't, but we all live by faith. But you get the idea. There's pastors and there's so-called full-time Christian workers. They're all working 60 hours a week. Not all of them, but many, 60 hours a week. And they're really busy doing things for God. They're visiting people in a hospital. They're running prayer meetings and they're preaching sermons and they're going to schools and ministering. And Here's the question. Are you doing... What God wants you to do. Well, what about those of us who not have a full-time Christian job? We've got a day job. Or we're retired. Or we're at school. Whatever. You, you could well be, the job that you're doing is that's exactly where God wants you to be. In a restaurant in a floor business, uh, nurses, doctors, wherever. I mean, God needs his followers in every job, right? God needs his people everywhere. So the question comes, okay, you're at work because that's where God wants you to do, where, where, where he wants you to be. Now, when you get home from work, after hours, when you're not at work, are you available for God to use you for what? He needs you to do outside of your day job? Are you actually available to serve his community? Are you available to serve his people? Or are you so busy in your life that you're seldom available? Yeah, but I'm doing this and I'm doing this. and Yeah, I'm 60 hours a week. I know that. But is that what God wants you to do? I know one thing, God doesn't want people to burn out. That's not part of his plan. So here's number two. Don't crucify me yet. We're coming to the good news in a minute. But number two, doing what God wants you to do is better than being busy for God. Doing what God wants you to do is better than being busy for God. So there's a couple of challenges with this way of thinking. The first one is the next point, the difficulty in hearing God. 
I, I, I can't hear him. I, I'm not sure what he's telling me. You see, if you want to distinguish between doing things for God and doing what God tells you to do, you have to have the ability to hear him and to listen to him. Because in the end, if you're a follower of Jesus, your goal is simply to obey God. That's, that's what we all desire, right? Say amen if your desire is simply to obey God. Amen. That's it. We're all there. We're all, we all want to do that. We all want to obey, obey God. God, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. But the enemy will make sure that he will sow the seeds to confuse your hearing. Here's one of the seeds that the enemy will use to distract you. Here's a good idea. We should start a what's the name ministry? Any volunteers? Just because it's a good idea, it doesn't mean that God's in it. Now, he may be, but not necessarily because there are way more good ideas than you can serve God in. Yeah, I can't do them all. And if the devil can get you so distracted by all the good ideas out there, he may be able to prevent you from doing what God actually wants you to do. Good ideas are a real distraction. Here's another one. Desperate needs. Oh my goodness, there is this desperate need and i got to help. Now, that could be God guiding you. But let me tell you, out of all the desperate needs that come to your world, you can't do them all. They're not all from God that he wants you to deal with. So good ideas and desperate needs, which is often how churches run. We find out in the press that there's a desperate need from the media and we all go run over there before we pray and say, does God want us to do that? Should we be helping Ukrainian refugees or not? Should we be helping the people in Israel or not? Desperate need. What about all the other needs that you don't know about? What about all the child soldiers in northern Nigeria being um, kidnapped for the Lord's People's Resistance Army? What about uh, all the rebels killing priests, Anglican priests, in eastern Congo? You don't, you don't know about that because you don't hear about it. There's a desperate needs everywhere. But what's God calling us to do? Here's another one. People's advice. Oh, my goodness. If it's not good ideas and desperate needs, it's people's advice. There, there, Peter. I've had this happen to me when I was a younger man. That little old lady grabs me on the cheek. Could have been a little old man, but it was a little old lady in this case. Grabbed me on the cheek and said, Peter, you know what you need to do? You need to become a pastor. Now, as it worked out, that's exactly what happened to me. But in the first part of my life, you know, when somebody comes up, you know what you need to do? Oh, my goodness. Now, sometimes God uses people, right? But a lot of times he uses them and distracts you. Because they never prayed about what they said to you. They just said it. See, good ideas, desperate needs and people's advice are not a guarantee that that's what actually God wants you to do. If you want to do what God wants you to do, now you know this, I want to reinforce this for you. There's two things that need to happen if, you've, if you're committed to doing what God wants you to do. Number one, you must be willing to do what God wants you to do. Yeah, yeah we'll get to that in a minute. But you've got to have an attitude that I'll do whatever God wants me to do, right? It doesn't work this way. Okay, God, you tell me what you want me to do and then I'll tell you if I'm going to do it or not. You're not going to hear him. If, that's, if it's conditional obedience, forget it. I'll do whatever God wants me to do, but... Ooh. You, 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 it's very hard to hear God if there's a but, right? 
If you really, really want to hear from God, you have to be willing to do whatever he wants you to do. Otherwise, the subtle voice may not get through because there's too many buts between you and God's will. That's why I try to teach you when God says jump, we say, when do you want me to come down? Right? Not how high. No, that's... No, we, we, we're going to ask God, if you want me to defy gravity, I'll do that to obey you. So the first question is, are you willing to do whatever God tells you? Like, if you hear people say, oh, I'm gonna, I love God, but I'll never be a missionary in Africa. Be careful, because he may exactly want you to be a missionary in Africa. I've been, you know, I've told you this, I've been wrong in every, except for marrying Jenny, pretty well every major decision in my life. I'm never going to be a pastor. I'll never be a bishop. I'll never live in North America. I'll never do postgraduate studies. I'll never join Youth for Christ. I'll never leave Youth for Christ. I'll never join the Anglican Church. I've been wrong in every major decision. If you haven't worked it out now, you just say, God, yeah, I'll do whatever you want and just show it to me. But here's the point. If you're not willing to obey him, if there's conditions on your obedience, it'll be hard to hear him. Hmm? It's hard to hear God if there's conditions. The second thing that he needs you to do, if you want to hear him, is you have to listen. You actually have to spend time listening to God. Being quiet. People tell me, oh, I have a quiet time. Actually, for many people, a quiet time is a lot of talking. (laughs) But you see, if you want to hear God, you've got to be able to listen to him. And here's the thing. You don't just listen to him when you're having your quiet time. You've got to have your ears open all the time. How many of you know that God speaks to you often when you least expect it? Have you ever had that experience? Right? You're digging in the garden and you're thinking about fertiliser. Or you're thinking about chafer beetles. I spent a lot of time in my garden, Tim, thinking about chafer beetles. And God will speak to me. I'll sit down quietly with my Bible, ready with a text to prepare a sermon. Nothing. And then I go mow the lawn. Bang. He's speaking to me. So... Right, So those two things, you have to be willing to do what he tells you to do if you're going to hear him. Because he may say something to you, and if your will's not there, it'll be harder to hear him. And second of all, you've got to actually spend some time listening to him. And you do that whatever. But, you know, here's, a, here's an experiment. When you're trying to find out what God wants you to do, sometimes you can just say, God... I really want to do your will. I don't care what it is. Just speak to me. The first thought that comes into your mind, try that. Then give it a go. This is what I think God wants me to do. Now watch this. Even if you get it wrong, God will honour that. Did you know that? God will honour a mistake if it's done in obedience. (laughs) I think God I got I think God wants me A or B. <laughs> A. Okay, I'm going to do A. And then you get down to A and guess what? It's totally wrong. Now you got your answer. I go back, I do B. <laughs> God told me he wanted me to do B. How do you know? Well, I tried A and it was the wrong one. <laughs> See how God will honor you? That's not disobedience. Disobedience is a different thing. Getting it wrong with the desire to obey God is a good thing. Because the more often you get things wrong, the more often you learn how to get them right. So you make a decision, you're a new Christian. I think God wants me to go and take flowers to Mrs Jones. So you go down to Safeway, you buy a big bunch of flowers, you drive to Mrs Jones's house and she's not home. She's moved to Alberta. (laughs) Okay, got that one wrong. Bring the flowers home for my wife. Um, Okay, God wants me to go and have a cup of tea with Mike. So I go around, knock on the door, Mike's not home. Okay. 
Got that one wrong. That's two wrong. Pray again. God wants me to give a little gift to Mrs. Smith, who's just lost her son. So I go and buy a little memento thing, and I arrive, and Mrs. Smith is home. And this little gift is exactly what she needed and touched her life and her soul. I got that right. One out of three, not bad. You keep practising that. And you know how that works, right? As a young Christian, you try and hear God's voice. You listen. You're willing to do whatever he tells you to do. You listen. And out of ten decisions, you get seven wrong. But you get three right. And you keep practising that. And you get older as a Christian. And you keep listening to God's voice. You keep hearing him. And then before you know it, it's five right and five wrong. And then you grow further as a Christian. Follow me, Kathy. Further as a Christian, <laughs> here I am, you get seven right and three wrong. And then eventually you might get nine right and one wrong. Whoa. You never get it 100% right, at least I don't. But here's the point, number three that I want to make. God will honour your efforts to obey him even if you get it wrong. God will honour your efforts to obey him even if you get it wrong. Now we've got to try and work out, as Sally said, what is God's will? What, what is he telling us to do? Well, look at the next number four here. Not necessarily bigger and better. When you try to work out what God's saying to you, What should you be motivated by in order to do God's will? What should the motivation be? Well, bigger isn't necessarily God's will. Just because you're going to do something and it's going to grow. Let's say you're a pastor and you do this and you're going to double the number of people in your church. That doesn't necessarily mean that's God's will. If you lead more people to Christ, what about this? What about if you do a crusade, you're an evangelist, and you do a crusade that God doesn't want you to do, and people get saved? Well, he'll use it, but that's not what he wanted you to do. And maybe you've got more numbers in your books. But bigger and more... That doesn't guarantee that that's what God wants you to do. Here's something, a better way to do it. This is much more expedient if we just do church on YouTube now. We're not going to do it in person. Look, YouTube is much more efficient. We don't have to deal with people, no problems. We can edit everything and we can reach way more people. Much better to do it that way. But is it God's will? I don't think so. You see, we don't measure our obedience based on the world's metrics. That's how the world thinks. This is what the church does. This is what followers of Jesus do. We listen for the voice of God and we obey that. Obviously, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world are based on different principles. They function differently. It's a different way of thinking. When you're in the world and you have to, you've got a business or you live in the world, you work in the world, you've got to think this way. But when you're following Jesus, the parameters of Jesus are slightly different. Bigger is not necessarily better in the kingdom of God. More is not necessarily better in the kingdom of God. More expedient, more efficient is not necessarily better in the kingdom of God. Obedience is always the best thing in the kingdom of God. Here's number four. Mature Christians are motivated not by bigger and better, but by obedience. So let's come and find if we can find out. Let's go back to the original question now. Are you actually doing what God wants you to do or are you just really, really busy doing things for God? 
Are you serving him in the way he wants you to serve? Are you actually asking God what he wants you to do? Do you actually know what your calling is in your life? Do you know what your calling is? Do you know what ministry God's called you to? If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have a calling and you have a vocation, you have a ministry. Are you aware of what that is? If God were to come and ask you for help for something, because to do the kingdom of God work, he needs people. If God were to ask you to help for something, would you have the time to help him? Uh, just hang on a minute, I'm really busy this week. Uh, contact me next week and we'll see. <laughs> do you have actually time to serve your community? We'll talk about that in a minute. So let's go to Peter now, shall we? I want to give you five light guide, just to finish with five guidelines from Peter. So in our reading today, Peter gives us the antidote for distraction. Verse 7 is the first thing. He puts the whole point of life into a context. He says this, 1 Peter 4 verse 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. The end of everything is near. This is not a chronological word. This is a word that God uses in the context of eternity. We are now in the last days. Creation's been completed. Flood's been done. Israel and kings and prophets has happened. Messiah has arrived. Resurrection, salvation has arrived. Pentecost has happened. Pentecost has happened. Now we're waiting for the second coming. We're in the last days. And Peter writes this as a way of understanding your priorities. What's really, really important to you right now? Here's a good way to imagine it. Let's say, as Jenny and I try to go to visit our family in Australia, and we have one week left before we have to come back home to Canada, what do you think we're trying to do in that one week? Go sightseeing? Um, go for walks along the beach? What do you think we're trying to do? Family, breakfast, lunch and dinner. <laughs> Why? Because it's really, really important. And we only got one week. Or imagine if, for instance, you have a disease and you're dying and you've only got so many months left to live. See, Peter is trying to say that the end is near and so your priorities and my priorities, we, we need to think about what's important from the kingdom perspective. Now, it might be another thousand years before Jesus returns, but in terms of what's important in life, the end is near. These, these are important things that we should be um, able to understand. Spiritual things are really important. And because that becomes a priority, you understand that because it's the end is near, we change our priority from you know, living life and being successful in life to paying attention to spiritual things, because of that, then what he says to you, you need to be alert and sober in mind so you can pray. In other words, you need to be self-aware. The Greek words here, alert and um, self-controlled is another thing, so that you can pray. You need to make priorities in your life so that you can pray. Your turn now. Why do we pray? To fulfill God's will. To fulfill God's will. To fulfill God's will. How do we fulfill God's will? By praying. Prayer changes things. Prayer changes things. You see, we often think that you pray to tell God what you need. No. Nah. Well, you can tell him everything you need. But what you want isn't necessarily what he's going to do. Prayer is a way of aligning our wills with him. 
connect with him. We pro- who, who do you think started the first prayer? Who initiated prayer? He did. When you pray, you're just responding to his prayers. You see, the reason we pray, the reason why you should be sober-minded and alert, in other words, the reason why you make this stuff important in your life compared to all the stuff you're involved in the world, the reason why it's important so you can pray, and you pray so that you can hear what he's telling you to do. Not just tell him what you want. Not my will be done, but thy will be done. It's the whole purpose of praying. So, you are alert and sober-minded so you can think clearly about your circumstances. We, we, we often, many, many people just live by reflex, knee-jerk reactions. Something happens, we re- No, we need to take time. See what God's doing so you can listen to what God's saying. So here's number five. First guideline against distraction. Live your life in such a way that you are more likely to hear God. (laughs) Live your life in such a way that you are more likely to hear God. Well, oh my gosh. How do you want me to do that? Well, I don't want you to do anything. I just want you to do what God tells you to do. Here's number verse eight. 1 Peter 4, 8, above all things, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. If you don't know what God's calling you to do, here's the first thing you could do. Go love each other. Now, you understand this is a community issue. You can't just love yourself, which you have to do. You have to love each other. We've got to learn how to love each other. We need to be available to love each other. And of course, the $64,000 question is, who is my community? I've been telling you this for years, but let me reiterate it. If you're a follower of Jesus, the most intimate thing two Christians can do is to have communion. Your community in a biblical sense, not necessarily the way the world has organised it, or even the modern church, frankly. No wonder people are leaving churches in droves. Your community are those with whom you break bread. That's your community. Yeah, but he's really weird. I know he's weird, but so are you. It's broken people together having communion. One beggar sharing with another beggar where to find the bread. If you're a regular here, this is your community. If you're not sure what you're supposed to do, what God's telling you to do, start by learning how to love this community. Which, by the way, you do, as as a church community, you do brilliantly. People tell me all the time that you got a phone call from someone else. Someone brought you vegetables. Someone did shopping for you. Someone cared for you. Someone phoned up about you. Someone texted you. So the first thing that Paul says, uh, Peter says, if you're not sure what God's telling you to do, start with this. Learn how to love your community. That is the people with whom you break bread, your spiritual community. That's your community. Yeah, your neighbours, your friends, your family, your kids, your grandchildren, that's your family. Your community, your biblical community is the people that you're breaking bread with every week. You're doing stuff that's more intimate with each other than husbands and wives do at home in the kingdom of God sense. So number six, very quickly, in order to love each other, you must be available to God. You must be available to God. Verse number nine, 1 Peter 4. So how do you love each other? How do you love each other deeply this is not superficial stuff well you offer hospitality with one another without grumbling oh no the cleaners are coming over for dinner (laughs) what a pain no without grumbling so we have to think about that how can we offer hospitality to each other well i don't know that person very well 
Well, guess how you get to know somebody? You've got to spend time with them. <coughs> Let me tell you something that is cultural in Canada that I think works against us for hospitality as Canadians. In Australia, we have a culture where we just drop into people and have a cup of tea with them. It's very British. Hey, we saw your light on, we thought we'd drop in. Yeah, come on in, have a cup of tea. Put everything down, have a cup of tea with the person. It's Australian culture. In Canada, you've got to have a booking a month ahead before you go have a visit. I get it, I understand why it happens. Sorry? Let's change that. Let's change that. Exactly. Exactly. We do, just ask me that. Yeah. Now, now, some of you do that. But the point that I'm trying to make here is, whatever the culture is, doesn't matter. If you're not sure what God's telling you to do, learn how to love each other deeply. And one of the ways you could do that is have hospitality. Now, I know Shy, she has a gift of hospitality. She has what I call the ministry to the interior. <laughs> And today at lunch, we're going to see the ministry to the interior. Hospitality with each other. Go have a meal together. Food is the international language. You can have fellowship with people, even if you don't speak their language, if you eat together. And do it without grumbling, because it's not a duty, it's a privilege. It's, this is what God is calling you to do to be hospitable to each other, to find the lonely people in your community, the ones that don't have spouses anymore, the ones who are living alone, the ones who are quiet and don't talk to anybody and reluctant, the newcomer. They're the people we're supposed to offer hospitality to. Not just that, you can use it as an instrument to invite people into the kingdom. Yeah, yeah. But this, this really, uh, Joel, this advice is for... Those of us who are believers, followers of Jesus, to prevent us from being distracted. You know what I mean? So that truth is true too, of course. You can invite people to the kingdom. But what I'm trying to focus on today is what's going to stop you and me from being distracted for doing all these really important things for God if God doesn't actually really want you to do them? Well, start off by loving each other. Find, if you don't have time to love each other, something's got to be you can change something. Find time to be in hospitality. Spend time with each other. Not just your friends, your community. So um, being in relationship with your community is one of the goals of the Christian life. You don't have to ask God, should I do this? He's telling you that you need to do this. So number seven, very quickly, the only two things which last forever are the word of God and the souls of people. They're the only two things that are going to go to heaven, the word of God and the souls of people. And I put, you should invest in both. You should invest in both. Let's wrap it up. Verse 10, now he gets down to the specifics. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received. Notice it's a gift. You don't train for this. It's given to you. God gives you gifts. And you've received it so you can serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So here's a question. Don't answer this. It's rhetorical. What are your gifts? Yeah, I know you can do this in the business world and in the school world and, and all of that, but what are your spiritual gifts? Oh, I don't have any. Mm -mm. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have gifts. And God requires you to exercise those gifts. Other people in the community are dependent on your gifts. If you're good with a shovel and we need to dig holes... Guess who God needs to help dig the holes? And if you're good with your mouth and speaking, and we have to do a speaking thing, guess who God needs if you're a good thinker? What are the spiritual gifts that you have? 
Have you actually spent time to determine what your gifts are? Now, not what you think your gifts are. (laughs) I've had people come to me in other churches say, "Um, I think I should lead worship. In fact, I had one lady who said, I think I should run the soundboard at the church. She had two hearing aids. Oh, dear. Right? Like deafness and mixing sound, with all respect, Kathy, but deafness and mixing sound don't necessarily go together, right? If you're tone deaf, you shouldn't be leading music singing worship. That's not good. So, but if you want to work out what your gifts are, you should ask other people. Your community, they can tell what you're good at. Once they get to know you, they can see it in you. And the purpose of your gift is so you can serve each other. So you can serve this community. So the question is, are you really, really busy being distracted by God or do you actually have the ability to serve your community? Well, what, what would I do? Gosh. Here's, I wrote down a bunch of things. Just to serve this community here. What happens if you've got the gift of preaching? Ed's got the gift of preaching. In fact, a couple of weeks each time he's going to be preaching. What happens if you like moving chairs and helping set up the furniture or praying? What about coming and cleaning the church? We have someone who cleans the church for us. The place is clean every Sunday. What about visiting the sick, praying with the sick? What about folding bulletins? What about greeting people at the church? What about cleaning the grounds? Ralph mows the lawns every once in a while. What about talking to the neighbours of the church? What about reading scripture? What about serving in some capacity? Not just Sunday. What are, what are you doing to serve your community I can't. I'm so busy. I'm so, I've got so much on. And I want to try and push back against that a little bit and say, look, think about this so that you're not doing stuff for God, but you're doing stuff because this is what God wants you to do. I want you to think about that. So number eight, remain available to God and your gifts will make room for you. Remain available to God and your gifts will make room for you. Many people are really gifted. And when I go and ask them, would you like to use that gift? They're not available. Not so much here. It happens, but not so much here. But in my other hats, where I, I have other hats, where I, I recognise a wonderful gift, but a person's not available. Because they're so busy. And so then Peter goes on and explains it and he sort of clarifies it in verse 11. If anyone speaks, they should speak the very words of God. If you serve, do it in God's strength. You're not doing it because it's a good idea or a need. You're doing it because this is what God wants you to do. And you do it in all things so that God may be praised through Jesus. The bottom line is that you should be able to know What you're doing is what God wants you to actually do because you heard him. He's talking to you. He's showing you this is what I want you to do. You put your arm around Jesus and say, thank you, Jesus, for allowing me to do this with you. Whatever it is. It may be a menial task. You don't want to do all the upfront stuff. That's got knobs on it. It's good for your self-esteem, but it's not necessarily good for your God-esteem. So number nine, as you grow, you will no longer find things for God. You will no longer uh, uh, do things for God, but do things because he's calling you to do them. You're not doing things for God. You're doing them because he's calling you to do them. This is what he wants you to do. Let me close with this. Many Christians in the world in which we live, in North America, even around our lives here, many of the Christians we know are so busy these days that they don't actually have time 
to do what God wants them to do. And often, when they're serving him, they're serving him in their own strength. They're doing it because they think it's a good idea, or there's a need, or someone asked them to do it. Not necessarily because that's what God wants them to do. And one of the reasons people burn out is when you're doing God stuff, is because you're doing it in your own strength, right? They think it's a good idea rather than what God's calling them to do. So t- today, I just pray you'll take this sermon seriously. And there's a lot of information, I get that, but I'm trying to get something to stick. Maybe you might consider your priorities in your life. The end is near. Consider what's really important in your life. Talk to God about what you're doing and, and listen to him. What's God saying to you about all the things you're doing, all the busyness? Now, let me give you a clue. If you're going to be available to God, you're going to have to start learning how we, all of us, we have to start implementing disciplines that are going to help simplify our lives. You're going to have to simplify and discipline your your digital life. The digital world is good. You get a lot of information. But it can be a huge distraction to your spiritual life. You're going to have to think about that. You're going to have to have a time when you turn your phone off. You're going to just have to discipline that. You, You... you're going to have to spend less time on Facebook and whatever. Here's an idea. Why don't you subscribe to less platforms? I found a really good way of preventing being deplatformed. I found out how not to get deplatformed. Don't get on any platforms. <laughs> I'm not on any platforms now. I've got rid of them all. So you can call me a homophobe and a whatever phobe. Doesn't matter to me because I'm not. Pla- I'm not. I'm not saying don't do them. I'm just saying if you want to do this live, you, we, we've got to simplify our digital life somehow. Turn the music off every once in a while. Turn the TV off and just have silence. Oh, that's really scary. <laughs> Stay in relationship with people, and if possible, to do that without the digital world. Here's something. As you simplify your commitments, learn how to say no. Because there's a million people out there who want to ask you for help. You can't do it all. Don't do something because it's a good idea or because there's a need. Here's one. Increase your spiritual commitment to your community. Increase your spiritual commitment to your community. There's one way you can do that, amongst many. Come to church every Sunday. Make it a goal in your life where possible. It's not always possible. I understand that, the world we live in. But where possible, and if it's not this church, somewhere, wherever you are, the airport chapel, wherever you're travelling... Make a commitment to be with your community every week where possible. It's really, really important to your spiritual journey. Make it a goal to work out what your spiritual gifts are. Cut out some stuff out of your timetable. Make sure you've got time to serve God. Come and serve wherever, but make time. Number 10, finish with this. Your life will never be as fulfilled and as abundant as when you are available to God. If you're doing stuff in your own strength, you'll burn out and life is a frustration. You just want to get out of church. You want to leave Christianity But if you're a follower of Jesus and you're available to do what God wants you to do, you will experience the abundant, fulfilled life. So let me pray for you that something's stuck today. God, Father God, 
I'm going to ask that you help us all in this (coughs) journey of the Christian life and especially the busyness of life that you help each one of us listen to you and just do what you tell us to do. Nothing more, nothing less and nothing else. And today we make a commitment to keep moving towards that journey of simplicity and obedience. And we thank you that you're here to help us and guide us and lead us in this process. I thank you for this community and for my brothers and sisters who love you. I pray your blessing on us now as we serve you and listen to your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here's your first thing in community. We can share the peace together. Brother and sister and brother and sister sharing the one thing we have in common together, which is God's peace. Well, well, one of many things. So could I ask you to please stand? And just to give you a heads up, we're going to finish the service with communion. So don't go home yet. (laughs) We're going to have communion after the peace. So I say to you, my brothers and sisters, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Now, you go share that peace with each other. Make our visitors especially welcome. Uh, Announcements on page 11, real quick. Remember, we're still at the church every night. If you haven't been yet at least once, come and visit us one night. We start at 7, finish about 8.30 now. But we're still coming every night. Since July, we've been at the church every night, seven nights a week, praying for you and for our community, and for the finances for the church. So uh, you're welcome to come. Ladies, refresh with Jenny and prayer every Tuesday morning, 10.30. Please come and join Jenny. All ladies are welcome. Also, we're doing a, we're doing a special activity in the afternoon, um, fermenting garlic and honey. So please come and join us. Fermenting garlic and honey, so yeah. things that people need to bring to Yeah, Jenny's become a prepper and a chemist. We have all these chemistry experiments. I don't know what she's brewing, but it smells pretty good. Uh, No support group, of course, on Thursday night while the prayer is going. Here's a really important need on page um, page 11, number four. We desperately need a a rental place for a single lady. If you know somebody that has a place where a single lady can rent, we've got to get her out of her environment at the moment. If you know a place or you know somebody who knows a place, Please come and talk to me about that. This is rather urgent right now. Don't forget after lunch today, community, uh, after church, community lunch. I've got a crew. We'll move the pews. We'll set up the tables at the back. We'll bring in the food. We'll have lunch together. Just a quick reminder that in a traditional church, you don't have food or drink in the sanctuary. Now, we can't do that because we don't have a hall. So just for lunchtime, we make the sanctuary a little shorter. <laughs> we move the pews up. So keep the food down that in. No food in the church part proper. But everybody's welcome. We've got plenty of food. Uh, if you're interested in the leadership prayer breakfast on the 27th of October in the morning, see Ed Hurd. Um, Arosha is having a Steve Bell concert on the 28th. See Steve and Shy if you're interested in that. And I'm happy to announce... Here's our first Operation Christmas Child shoe box. Thank you, Zelda, for bringing the first box. Please take one or two boxes and bring them back to church. We've got another month to go. We have to return them by the 12th of November. So look at our offering sentence today. I will come to your temple with burnt offerings and fulfil my vows to you. What are the vows you've made to God? Well, when you became a Christian, you made a vow to obey him. So why don't we stand and the offering baskets will come. The the guys will pass them down each pew. As the baskets come down, maybe grab the basket. Even if you don't put any money in it, maybe you could say, God, I'm just putting my obedience, offering that to you. So would you please stand? And we'll take up our offering. I put a second verse in about serving one another. So be ready for that. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life.
Lord, I love to serve your people. I'm so glad they're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My dad to pay. So that's why I'm telling you that, because I want you to pray, right? We've done our job. We've sown the seeds, but only God can make them grow. We can even harvest them. I can, I can go to the post office and pick up a check. That's the harvesting. But the growing part, God putting it on somebody's heart, that's between them and God, and that's done by prayer. So we've done our open house. We've had our fundraiser dinner. We're all, all the most, almost all the way through writing all our letter campaigns. We've had, I've had numerous luncheons with numerous business people, <coughs> some of whom are still thinking about whether they might be able to help. And so your job now is to pray for that. Pray that God will touch their hearts. And uh, let's watch a miracle happen. It's been a miracle to get us to this far. It's just a few more stepping stones. And we need another couple of miracles. So I'm going to ask you to pray. If you've got any other comments, don't hesitate to let me know and ask um, me during lunch today. So let's do something 
the most intimate thing that we Christians can do with each other is share this meal together. Page 15, I say to you, lift up your hearts. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Loving God, we thank you for this world of wonder and delight. You have given it to us to care for so that all your creatures may enjoy its bounty. Lord our God, we thank you that when we turned away from you, you sent Jesus to live and work as one of us and bring us back to you. He showed us how to love you and set us free to love and serve one another. Lord our God, we give you thanks and praise. And so with everyone who believes in you, with all the saints and all the angels, we rejoice and praise you, saying together as a community, Holy, 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 Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Now we thank you for these gifts of bread and wine. May we who receive them, as Jesus said, share his body and his blood. On the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he gave you thanks. And then he broke the bread and he gave it to his friends and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup and he gave you thanks. And he shared the cup with them and said, This is my blood poured out so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in remembrance of me. And we respond with this age-old anthem as we say together. Christ has died and Christ has risen and Christ will come again. That's what Peter said, that the end is near. And so we, who are many, are actually one body because we all share in one together. Lord, you taught us to hope for salvation the joy of every longing heart. And so we pray for the coming of your kingdom in the words our Saviour taught us. This is our prayer of obedience. We pray it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and glory, forever and ever. Amen and amen. So I say to you, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace, and opened the gate of glory. May the we who share Christ's body, may the Christian life, may the I was just thinking as you and I were having communion, you know, God gave his life so that we can do that. That's pretty big, pretty intimate, right? You and I having communion and God had to die so that we could do that. That's what it means to be in community. Would you please stand? We'll say our blessing. If you're a visitor, we have these four declarations. The first three, we point to the cross we do this actively in the fourth declaration. We raise our hands up in hope. Is there anybody that could come and help with the blessing today? Good job. Thank you. So we say this because we mean it and believe it. What are you going to do about all your problems? And what do we do with all our difficulties? And what are you going to do about all the devil's works and distractions?
and all our hopes set on the risen Christ. Well, thank you. Thank you for being here today. Before you go, let me ask you, as you go this week, think about your life and the distractions that the enemy wants to bring to you and see if there are things, maybe mid-course corrections that you might need to do so that you're not just working for God, doing stuff for him, but you're actually doing stuff that he wants you to do. Think about that this week and see what he says to you. And of course, please stay for lunch afterwards. We're just going to set up. So if you move out of the pews, the boys will move the pews. We'll set up the tables. We'll have lunch straight away. And a final blessing. I've been doing funerals this week, quite a few. I've got a couple next week to do. And I tell the people that I say to you that I tell them this blessing. And when you're at a funeral and someone you love has died and passed away, this blessing is very, very powerful. And it's for you and me too. And so I say to you, go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Fight the good fight of faith so that you may finish your course with joy. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and Holy Spirit, Rest on you and those you love, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let's remain standing and tell God how much we want to serve him.